What were some of the stupidest crimes we covered in 2023 that people actually went through with? Let's get right to it with this marathon video. Who are some of the dumbest criminals who don't like using their brains? Let's find out, starting with... Number six, bodybuilding lies. A bodybuilding couple's travel insurance claim unraveled because of uploading incriminating Facebook photos. This is yet another example of why sharing too much on social media is stupid. The case involved bodybuilder Leon Roberts and his then partner Jade Mazoka. They attempted to claim compensation for food poisoning they said they suffered during a vacation in Turkey. They said that they fell seriously ill and couldn't go out for more than two weeks while on their vacation. But a collection of 79 photos posted on their Facebook accounts showed a completely different story. The pictures painted a clear image of Roberts and Mazoka enjoying an array of meals from steaks to sushi. Several images showed them giving a thumbs up as they dug into their meals. Roberts had initially sought compensation from travel firm Thompson and the hotel he stayed at, but later decided to withdraw his claim. It was clear from the Facebook pictures that their claims of being bedridden due to food poisoning were lies. The evidence on social media displayed them enjoying their vacation, dining out, and enjoying touristy things. Leon Roberts and Jade Mazoka received suspended jail terms, a stern warning from the judge, and a clear message that fraudulent compensation claims wouldn't be tolerated. The judge talked about the huge burden that false claims place on the vacation industry and the associated costs that honest travelers have to bear. Number five, TikTok will melt your brain. Australian Dahlia Caresi posed as a medical professional while dispensing advice to unsuspecting followers on TikTok and Instagram. Typical TikTok behavior. Caresi, known as Dr. Caresi on social media, created an image of herself as a qualified doctor. She offered guidance on serious health issues, including ovarian cancer, HIV, and fertility, despite lacking any medical qualifications whatsoever. Her two Two-year charade came to an abrupt end when she was arrested for impersonating a doctor and pretending to be a medical specialist. The prosecution was initiated by the Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency, with each offense carrying a potential maximum penalty of $60,000 or three years in jail. It seems like Carezzi didn't pretend to be a doctor for financial gain, but rather for the status and attention she received. Throughout her stint as Dr. Carezzi, she gathered a substantial following with 243 thousand followers on TikTok and 20,000 on Instagram. However, Carezzi's desperate need for attention ultimately led to the dismantling of her reputation and her community standing. Pretending to be a doctor puts countless individuals who sought accurate and reliable medical advice putting their health at risk. Granted, if you're getting your medical advice from TikTok, you should probably not do that because that's very dangerous. The extent of Carezzi's impersonation went beyond her online identity. She claimed to have earned a medical degree, including including a MBBS and a Master's of Reproductive Medicine, leading to her securing research positions with NSW Health and the Cancer Institute. Following her arrest, Carezzi expressed deep remorse for her actions in a 1,400-word letter of apology, since people are always the most sorry when they get caught. She explained that her deception began as a small white lie to impress a friend and gradually escalated into a double life. The magistrate sentenced Carezzi to a community corrections order for two years and imposed a fine of 13300 Carezzi's pursuit of status on social media is an example of the dangers of prioritizing online fame over responsible behavior. While some may be enticed by the allure of status, there can be serious and severe consequences. And her nonsense of saying that she just told a white lie once and that spun into her giving advice to people with HIV and fertility? Number four, hurting for a squirt, uh, carjacking. A Florida man's quest for romance took a turn when he was set up to be carjacked during during a date arranged through a dating app. Brianna Eady, an unidentified 35-year-old Orlando man, had connected on tagged dating app and decided to meet in person. The couple met up at an apartment complex and went on a drive in the victim's Mazda CX-9. They were heading to a park, an odd venue for a first date, but whatever, but found out that the park was closed. So they returned to the apartment complex. During the drive back, the victim noticed that Edie was constantly on her phone, a sure sign things were going well. She was sending 
sending and receiving multiple text messages and making phone calls, probably to tell everyone how great the guy was. Her behavior definitely wasn't suspicious. When they got back to the apartment complex around midnight, they were confronted by two men, one of whom was carrying a firearm. The armed man demanded the victim exit his vehicle and hand over the keys. Then Edie exited the vehicle calmly and appeared to wait around. She was in on it. We know you're shocked. The victim was ordered to lie down on the grass while the two men and Edie hopped into his stolen vehicle and drove off together. The victim provided photographs of Edie from the dating app, which led to her identification and subsequent arrests. The thing is, Edie might have avoided getting caught if she had pretended to be a victim herself rather than helping the carjack. Instead, she faced an armed carjacking felony charge and incarceration in the Brevard County Jail. And worst of all, she never found out if there would be a second date. Number three, the butt dial. Nathan Teckel Merriam and Carson Reinhardt found themselves behind bars after accidentally butt dialing 911 during an escapade in Fresno, California. The pair was cruising around a local neighborhood, casually discussing their criminal related activities when one of them butt dialed emergency services. The dispatcher listened as the duo talked about how much they loved to use illegal substances and couldn't believe his ears as their conversation continued for 40 minutes. However, the plot took an unexpected turn when the talk trans transitioned from substances to plans of breaking into cars. One of the guys said he was going to need some tools, and he even mentioned the need for a hammer. Not long after that, the dispatcher heard the unmistakable sound of breaking glass. The burglars, obviously completely unaware that they were being broadcasted to the police, celebrated finding prescription bottles inside the car they had broken into. During the call, the alert dispatcher was collecting clues, attempting to figure out the whereabouts of the two suspects. Eventually, the police were able to pinpoint their location as they drove away from the crime scene. During the arrest, Teckel Merriam and Reinhardt claimed that they were merely driving a friend home. However, the backseat of their vehicle told a different story, as it was filled with items stolen from the burglarized car. Teckel Merriam and Reinhardt were booked into jail on multiple charges, including burglary, conspiracy to commit a crime, and possession of stolen property. What's the craziest thing you've ever heard when you've been butt-dialed? Tell us about it in the comments. Number two, home alone. On a chilly Christmas morning in Gainesville, Georgia, a robber reenacted a scene from the classic movie Home Alone. Luis Sesbacho Ordonez decided to rob a local business on this festive day. Hiding behind the business, he brandished a firearm and demanded cash from an employee who was coming out of the building around 1 a.m. on Christmas morning. But Luis's ill-fated heist took an unexpected trip. As he attempted to make his escape, he slipped on a patch of ice and fell flat on his back. His mishap bore a striking resemblance to the famous scene from Home Alone, where one of the burglars, Marv, slips on ice while attempting to break into the McAllister's house. Responding to the incident, local EMS treated Luis's injuries and he found himself being taken into custody and transported to the Hall County Jail. Luckily, the peculiar episode ended without anyone being harmed and the attempted robber's grand scheme was thwarted by a patch of ice. Number one, Facebook Diaries. Even though this is an older story, it's still too good to not highlight. Two thieves in the UK, Jonathan Dugan and Matthew Murphy, managed to land themselves behind bars for nine years because of their own blatant self-incrimination on Facebook. The duo embarked on a seven-month spree of thefts and robberies, which included the theft of high-performance cars, motorcycles, and bottles of champagne from various victims all over the UK. Their criminal escapades came to an end not through meticulous police work, or elaborate investigations, but rather because of their overwhelming desire to show off their loot on Facebook. The pair stupidly posted near 50 images on Facebook with each photo offering undeniable proof of their crimes. Bragging about everything they stole left behind a treasure trove of incriminating evidence. Acting on a tip from one of the victims, the former owner of a KTM motorbike. Police needed a little more than a few clicks to uncover all the evidence they needed. After a court hearing, Jonathan Dugan and Matthew Murphy were both sentenced to nine years and four months in prison. The lesson here is pretty obvious. Social media is not the platform for bragging about your criminal achievements. While this story isn't recent, it still serves as a reminder of the amazingly stupid ways in which people incriminate themselves. So if you ever plan on ripping off a bunch of people, probably don't brag about it on one of the most popular social media outlets. What are some of the dumbest crimes people actually do? Let's find out what they did. Starting with... Number six, the thirsty thief. 
Harry Rose and Connor Gooderson decided to risk jail time by stealing alcohol from a hotel bar. Interestingly, this story doesn't start with Rose and Gooderson stealing alcohol. It starts with them going into a Marks and Spencer, which is a very popular chain British store, near the Gatwick Hotel in London late at night. Once in the store, they stole steak, meat, protein bars, and fizzy drinks. Their next adventure was to be found at a nearby airport hotel. They forced open the hotel's doors, and Rose entered to see what he could steal while Gooderson acted as a lookout. Once in the hotel, Rose found himself in the bar area and started stealing the hotel's liquor. He also decided to pour himself a glass of beer while robbing the bar, which is something all clever thieves do. While Rose was robbing the store, a hotel staff member interrupted him. But instead of explaining to the staff member that he was just a gentleman robber, Rose dropped his bag of stolen alcohol and ran out of the hotel. Unfortunately for him, he didn't get very far and was arrested by the police just a few minutes later. Rose and his lookout Gooderson were charged in court and they admitted theft and burglary. Rose said that he was only robbing the stores because he wanted to pay off the debt that his father owed a strange man. That's a pretty strange excuse given that Rose mainly just stole alcohol. Maybe he wanted to pay the man off with bottles of alcoholic beverages. Number five, Samantha Lotus can't fix your eyes. Canadian influencer Samantha Lotus said that she could fix eyesight without glasses for just $11. Lotus had around 20,000 followers on Instagram and was known for posting content about spirituality. In a now deleted video, she claimed that people who use glasses were misled and didn't need the glasses to see. Lotus said that the reasons they had eye problems were because of mental, emotional, and spiritual reasons that had nothing to do with their actual eyes. She further claimed that she could solve those problems for them and stop them from using glasses. Samantha Lotus is the hero we need, taking down big optometry. However, there was a catch. Followers had to purchase an $11 ticket to attend her masterclass. She also warned her followers that the class wasn't for closed-minded people who wanted to stay victims. Because, and you didn't know this, but Samantha does, people who are victims of bad eyesight have made this a choice. That probably should have been the fourth or fifth red flag. Amazingly, some people actually showed up to Lotus's masterclass. According to Mallory, a TikTok user who tries to combat disinformation on the internet, Lotus made roughly $5,000 through the event which at $11 a head, that's a decent turnout. However, the class was unhelpful as Lotus just told the people in the class to work harder on their spiritual, mental, and emotional states to stop using glasses. Kind of like when Paris Hilton told people to just stop being poor. Apparently, Lotus feels that people should just try harder to see without glasses. Lotus has come out to deny Mallory's claims and argued that she never said people didn't need glasses. She also said that her class was just to help people improve their eyesight through healing. Glasses probably help more than healing though, right? Mallory continued to post about Lotus's scam masterclass session, but Lotus wasn't having it. She threatened to get the police involved, but Mallory didn't care and kept right on exposing her. Lotus didn't just go after Mallory either. She went after anyone with an audience who criticized her. This included Dr. Siab Panwar, a board-certified interventional cardiologist who called Lotus a gaslighting quack. The American Academy of Ophthalmology also said that Lotus's claims were entirely fictional. Unfortunately for Lotus's victims, they've paid for her masterclass and she's held it. No outrage can force her to refund the money paid, so she probably got away with it, despite her scam being transparently ridiculous. Oh, and here's a shocker, Lotus's whole masterclass was apparently to promote doTERRA, a company that sponsors her and sells health and wellness items. The company made it clear that its products aren't intended to cure or prevent any disease, but it appears her masterclass was more about making money. We need to invent something that cures or prevents people like Samantha Lotus. Number four, the misbehaving therapist. Anna Cecilia Torado Cabrera faced charges for billing Florida's Medicaid system for charging for services she never rendered. Torado's fraud came to light after an anonymous tipster told the authorities to look into her work conduct. Preliminary investigations found that she was meant to be providing behavioral health care to a patient six times a week, but usually only came maybe three or four times a week. Each visit to the patient lasted around 40 minutes, and things got even more infrequent after Torado gave birth. According to the 
mother of the young patient. Dorado only came over to provide treatment maybe two or three times after she gave birth. Sometimes she came over, parked her car outside the premises, and then called to ask if she could be excused because her pregnancy was taking a toll on her health. Throughout all of this, Torado was billing the Medicaid system for phantom six times a week visits. She even once billed for 11 straight days of therapy, which began just three days after she gave birth. This obviously never happened. It's odd because no one would seriously believe that she went to work for 11 straight days just three days after giving birth. In any case, the authorities eventually uncovered the full extent of the fraud and found that Torado had billed nearly $30,000 for services she never rented. She was arrested and has now been charged with filing a false Medicaid claim. And look, we're not saying it's impossible for her to be working three days after giving birth, but it definitely seems like creating babies is uh, tough work. Number three, she really wanted it. Accountant Sophie Workman cheated her clients out of around 150,000 pounds in a calculated and persistent fraudulent scheme that was so obvious it was almost guaranteed to be traced back to her. Sophie Workman worked with all sorts of different clients and had a lot of knowledge about their internal operations. She used this knowledge to set up more than 40 different bank accounts and then used a series of fake or duplicated invoices to request payments from her victims' creditors. Through this, she was able to steal about about 150,000 pounds. Her victims only began to realize that something was wrong when their clients complained about invoices that hadn't been paid despite money leaving their accounts. The police got involved and before long, they figured out that Workman was the one behind the whole scheme. Police raided her home and found a note where she had a list of everything she wanted. It was an I want list where she wrote that she wanted to make a lot of money quickly to be clear of her debts and buy her own house. Unfortunately, for Workman, it doesn't seem those dreams will be coming through anytime soon. But this isn't all Workman's fault. In court, Workman's lawyer claimed that she'd been pushed to a world of crime by an unnamed ex who made her continue these crimes when she wanted to stop. In the end, Workman was sentenced to two years and four months in prison. We're not sure how she thought she was going to get away with the whole thing either, since everything was going to lead back to her anyway. Maybe the last thing on her I want list was getting caught? Number two, here to deposit my change. Slavo Kavic stole over $170,000 from parking meters and used the money to throw lavish parties to entertain his friends. Kavic had been employed as a parking meter repairman and he used his position to fleece the city and enrich himself. After emptying the parking meters, Kavich would take the bag of coins to the bank and deposit the money into his bank account. Kavich got so blatant with his crime that he even convinced his colleagues to empty boxes for him and gave them a cut out of the proceeds. His crime was only discovered when the city noticed that the returns from Kavich's parking meter were lower than expected. So they installed CCTV cameras in the area and Kavich was caught completely red-handed. But even without the CCTV installation, Kavich would have been caught anyway. He worked as a parking meter technician and was constantly depositing loads of coins into his bank account. It would be clear that something was fishy and anyone even taking a look would have figured out what was wrong. Our not so clever parking meter repairman pled guilty to nine counts of theft and one count of knowingly dealing with the proceeds of crime. In court, Kavich had an interesting story to tell when he was asked why he stole. He said that he'd grown up in a socially restrictive household and hadn't been allowed to make friends with people who weren't Croatian or Christian. This made him quite lonely, and he grew up thirsty for validation from his friends. He said that this thirst for validation moved him to constantly throw parties for his friends. At first, he could afford those parties, but soon he ran out of money. So he decided to steal money to continue hosting them, and that's what made him start stealing from the parking meter. The judge heard his sob story, but still decided that he deserved some jail time. He was then handed a nine-month jail sentence and told to serve a two-year community corrections order. Number one. No, I didn't fake that. A Chinese woman known as Tang has been caught on camera trying to scam the unsuspecting owner of a truck by pretending he ran her over. It's a popular scam in China known as Peng Tsi in Chinese. The scam is a popular way for scammers to bilk money out of unsuspecting victims by pretending to be hit by their car, then demanding cash. Apparently Tang was in a business dispute
dispute with the owner of the truck and had lost the dispute. But instead of accepting her fate, she decided that she would teach the guy a lesson. She took a bicycle, ran after the owner of the truck in person, and threw the bicycle beneath the truck when it rolled to a stop. Afterwards, she crawled underneath the vehicle. Tang's goal was to claim that the driver had hit her and perhaps earn some money from the scheme. But that's not what happened. A CCTV camera along with several people were witnesses to the event, and the truck was barely moving when Tang crawled underneath it in full view of the driver. After acting out her big scene, she then called the police to complain that she'd been hit. The police arrived soon enough, and Tang claimed that she had been hurt and needed compensation of around 6,400 pounds. Because, of course, money fixes everything. But the scam did not work. The police saw the CCTV footage and discovered that the entire show was a ruse by Tang and that she was the one at fault. In the end, she was left looking like the dumb criminal she was. The only reason why this story even made our cut was because she was so ridiculous in trying to scam the truck owner that she already knew. As if the owner wasn't going to think anything was up as soon as he or she saw her. Who are some of the dumbest criminals out there? Let's find out starting with... Number 7. Another Rap Confessional Brooklyn-based rap collective Pop Out Boys committed credit card fraud and bragged about it in one of their songs. The group released For a Scammer, a track where they talked about credit card fraud, which they called Cracking Cards, they bragged about lavish shopping sprees at luxury stores like Saks Fifth Avenue with the money they scammed. Most of the members grew up in the same neighborhood, with some being an actual pop-out boy in the group, and others being part of the group's entourage. The pop-out boys used websites like Unix Shop, Joker Stash, and Rescator, which sell data from security breaches at major retailers and other businesses. Card numbers cost $35 to $150, bucks, although there are cut-rate sites that post them for as little as a dollar. The websites operate like any other online retailer, featuring shopping carts, a checkout process, and customer service. Some of the sites even offer loyalty programs, money-back guarantees, and frequent buyer discounts. Once a customer gets card numbers, they can search for them by bank, zip code, credit limit, and the length of time since someone stole the information. Authorities aren't able to do much to shut down the sites since most use VPNs and can only be accessed on the dark web. Others have multiple entry points, so when one is shut down, the owners quickly switch to another. A core group of 11 pop-out boys bought the card numbers from at least five websites. They accessed over 2,000 credit card numbers from banks in Canada, Germany, Dubai, and France, and they shared the information in texts and emails with one another. Several other people in the group bought encoding machines and other equipment so they could manufacture the counterfeit credit cards. The gang also recruited friends to shop at stores like Barney's and Saks, sending them to buy luxury items like Celine and Goyard handbags, designer shoes, and Balmain jeans. The group made 275 purchases at Barney's over 55 days, leaving with $258,000 worth of items. Saks also lost $11,000 in merchandise in just two months. Ant Stay Machen, which is his special pop-out boy name that he picked for himself, his real name is Anthony McCoy, was the main pop-out boy and supplied the stolen card numbers to other pop-out boys, manufactured the cards, and then spent $4,000 at Barney's and Saks. McCoy posted photos of himself holding wads of $100 bills on his Facebook page. Kayshawn Trisven, who's like the pop-out boy that's always shopping, made 35 trips to Barney's and spent $44,000. With the help of the group's song, For a Scammer, investigators tracked down the pop-out boys' operation and arrested most of the 39 members. McCoy pleaded not guilty to the charges, despite authorities finding the encoding machine and an embosser in his home. Trisvan also pleaded not guilty, despite police finding 120 forged cards and $3,315 at his home to literally write lyrics, bragging, explaining how they scammed a bunch of people is outright stupid and make sure they get caught quicker. Number six, it actually worked. 
Grocery store employee Trey Brown scammed more than $980,000 from his employer. It only took two weeks for Brown to steal almost $1 million from the Georgia Kroger, a discount supermarket where he worked. Brown created dozens of returns for items that didn't exist and refunded the money onto his credit cards. He would make up products and assign them a random price, with the refunds ranging from $75 to $87,000. Yes, you heard that right. He returned something for $87,000 thousand dollars to a grocery store. You can guess how this is gonna go. His transactions were small at first, but became larger when he realized he was getting away with it. Despite stealing such a large amount of money over a short period of time, Brown made no effort to be discreet and hide his actions. Once the money was in his account, he treated himself to clothes, shoes, and a couple cars. The teen's volume of refunds put him on Kroger's corporate team's radar. Surprise, surprise. Although he worked at the grocery store for less than a month, he had already processed over 40 transactions. Brown's employer reported him to authorities who didn't have to wait long to locate him. While driving one of his new cars, Brown lost control and totaled it. Law enforcement arrived at the scene and arrested him. He was charged with theft by taking and could get one to 10 years in prison. And he probably could have gotten away with it if he didn't have rocks for brains and take so much so fast. Seriously, $87,000 at a Kroger? You could probably clean out three aisles and still not spend that much. You might as well have turned on a flashing neon sign. Number five, scooting away. Patrick Vandermaden Miller made no effort to conceal his actions when he stole a $540 scooter from his local Target. Vandermaden Miller picked out his new scooter and took it to the front of the store. But rather than pay for it like the other customers, he just walked past the cashiers. He was so brazen that he might have gotten away with it if he hadn't decided to stop on the sidewalk in front of the store to assemble the scooter. Law enforcement arrived at the scene before he could finish putting together his new mode of transportation and took it from him. Authorities arrested him and gave him a ride to jail. The sheriff at the Flagler County Sheriff's Office dubbed Vandermaden Miller as the dumb criminal of the week for thinking he could walk into a store and steal something without facing the consequences. Officials also found illegal substances on Vandermaden Miller and charged him with petty theft and possession of paraphernalia. Why he'd decide to put together the scooter right outside of Target is anyone's guess. Maybe the scooter was too heavy or difficult to assemble or he wanted free food and in jail? Maybe he just liked the ambiance of those red shopping carts providing him comfort like a security blanket. But most likely he was just dumb. Number four, Buster Screen arrested for bank fraud. Former Tennessee Titans defensive back Buster Screen defrauded multiple Canadian banks of more than $100,000. Screen visited several Canadian financial institutions to open new accounts with fraudulent checks which he cast a portion of before they fully cleared. Screen had a successful career with the NFL, playing his entire pro football career in the U.S. He attended the University of Tennessee before the Cleveland Browns drafted him in the fifth round of the 2011 NFL Draft. He signed with the Jets after four seasons with the Browns and had short stints in Chicago, San Francisco, and Tennessee before retiring in 2022. Despite his fame, the ex-NFL player made no effort to conceal his identity, giving his real name during each transaction, making it easy for law enforcement to track him down. Investigators learned that a man was entering numerous financial institutions and identifying himself as Buster Screen. So authorities launched a fraud investigation and with the help of Homeland Security and U.S. Customs and Border Protection, arrested the 34-year-old at Toronto's Pearson Airport while he tried to board a flight back to the U.S. Screen was charged with four counts of fraud, seven counts of making false statements to procure money, one count of possessing property obtained by crime under $5,000, and three counts of possessing property obtained by crime over $5,000. Police said they had reason to believe Screen committed similar offenses in other parts of Canada as well. And what was the possible end game here? He didn't even use an alias. What was his plan to get away once he gave them his name? Number three, the birth certificate. Michael Lloyd robbed a Missouri bank while wearing a court-ordered ankle monitor and scribbling a demand note on the back of his birth certificate. Lloyd went into a Bank of America and approached the bank teller, handing her a note, demanding cash, and warning that he had an accomplice outside. The teller took the money from one of the drawers and gave it to him. He wrote the note in pink highlighter on the back of his birth certificate. Lloyd fled the scene in his roommate's truck, texted the roommate to tell her that he had stolen her vehicle, and told her to listen to the police scanner. The roommate's boyfriend called the police 
police, which led them to his apartment. Lloyd waived his Miranda rights and admitted he was behind the robbery. As part of a state supervised release, Lloyd was wearing a court-ordered ankle monitor following a past robbery. The device placed him at the scene at the time of the holdup and led the police to him. But authorities might not have needed to track his ankle monitor since the would-be robber threw his birth certificate and ID out of the window after seeing police cars speeding towards the Bank of America branch. As he sped away, Lloyd called his girlfriend, Ashley, to tell her what he'd done. Lloyd was arrested and faced a maximum sentence of 20 years in prison and a $250,000 fine. Lloyd said he orchestrated the bank robbery after he had a fight with his girlfriend. He wanted to prove a point to her, although he didn't seem to be able to say what that point was. But whatever the point was, we're sure he definitely showed her. What do you think the point he was making was? Let us know in the comments. Number two, crime doesn't pay. Donald Murray's crime pays forehead tattoo helped law enforcement identify him when he fled the scene following a high-speed chase. It was the second time he'd been arrested in the last two months after another high-speed chase. Murray and his tattoo went viral after a high-speed chase that resulted in his arrest. Murray was featured on an episode of Live PD, where the large crime pays tattoo across his forehead caught viewers' attention. Officers attempted to pull Murray over for driving without his headlights on at night. Murray put his foot on the accelerator and and fled the scene, prompting the police to chase after him. While speeding away, he lost control of his vehicle and crashed into a tree. So he jumped out of the car and fled the scene on foot, actually getting away. A passenger was left behind at the site of the crash, but didn't know the driver's name. Since no one really knew who he was at that point, he probably could have gotten away clean. Unfortunately for Murray, his tattoo made him pretty easy to identify. Viewers from Live PD recognized him quickly and notified the cops. As it turns out, having a dumb, memorable tattoo on your forehead can make you pretty recognizable. Murray ended up getting charged with possession, resisting arrest, reckless driving, maintaining a common nuisance, and auto theft. And what on earth was he even doing driving at night with no lights? The face tattoo is dumb enough as it is, but driving nearly blind is just dumb and dangerous. Number one, it's right outside. Boost Mobile employee Jatendra Kumar Sass tricked a would-be thief by locking him inside the store. Sean Brown entered the Philadelphia Boost Mobile store location and asked for iPhones before leaving the store. When Brown returned and brandished a firearm, Jatendra Kumar Sass was the only person working. He pointed the weapon toward Kumar Sass's head and demanded the employee give him money. Brown became angrier when Kumar Sass said he had no money, but the Boost employee had a plan. Kumar Sass lied about having another employee outside who had money, so he asked Brown to wait a few minutes while he went to go get him. Brown waited in the store while Kumar Sass went outside. But once the clerk was out of the store, he shut and locked the door behind him and pulled down the metal security gate. When Brown realized Kumar Sass had tricked him and was now stuck inside the building, he attempted to free himself by firing 10 rounds at the door, but it didn't work. So he went down to the store's basement and beat on the neighboring store's door. But the door was too strong and he couldn't move it, even after he fired at the lock in an attempt to open it. Hey, it works in movies, right? Local police, Homeland Security, and a SWAT team arrived at the scene. The SWAT team used a bullhorn to tell Brown to come out and reminded him that he was trapped inside. Since he already tried multiple ways to leave the building, he eventually gave up and surrendered around 30 minutes after law enforcement arrived. Brown was arrested and entered police custody. Maybe he would have gotten away with it if he wasn't dumb enough to let Kumar Sass leave the building midway through the robbery. He must not watch enough movies. What are some of the dumbest crimes people will do? Let's find out, starting with... Number 5. Just Tax Money Jorge Contreras was arrested for embezzling millions of dollars from the school district he worked in. To make matters worse, Jorge wasn't just stealing from regular schools with regular students. The schools in the district he worked in mostly served as students from disadvantaged backgrounds, so the district received millions in federal aid. Jorge saw those millions and decided they were his to spend, and boy oh boy, Jorge spent a lot of it. His total was $14 million, and he spent it on the best luxuries he could find. First, he used the money to pay off American Express bills, totaling about $1.9 million. He then withdrew cash worth about $325,000 and bought a house worth $1.5 million. After that, he bought a BMW worth over $100,000 and gave his husband $130,000. 
He also made payments to himself directly from district funds. The authorities found more than 250 checks deposited into his personal bank accounts. The checks ranged from around $11,000 to $95,000. Jorge dropped over three hundred and sixty dollars on Versace stuff and another $60,000 on some Louis Vuitton, all in the space of one month. He then spent $180,000 on jewelry from David Human over two weeks. You can just imagine the sort of extravagant lifestyle this guy was living. And he didn't hide it either. He was constantly posting evidence for the world to see on Instagram and garnered over 2.7 million followers. His husband also had a significant following because he also lived a large life on what we presume was the school district's dime. He and his husband always looked so glammed up that you would be forced to wonder how Jorge was getting his money. But Jorge wasn't eventually outed by his online extravagance. Instead, he slipped up. The district superintendent was alerted by Wells Fargo about some fraudulent charges on the school funds account, and he went digging. Before long, he found altered bank statements, which led to an investigation. The investigation revealed Jorge to be the thief, and he was promptly arrested. The thing is, Jorge would have been caught eventually, since that amount of money is going to be noticed by someone at some point. He was a public official, and while they can make decent money, they're not millionaires. Jorge spent so much money and lived such a flashy life style that people would have eventually started snooping around. And it's not like it takes even that much investigating. The guy is lucky he wasn't caught sooner. Number four, do it for prison time. Rossi Adams is a former social media influencer who has now been convicted for influencing his cousin to hold someone up. We say former because Adams got 14 years in the slammer and his cousin got 20. But what exactly did the duo do to go to prison? Our story starts way back in 2015 when Rossi was just a random student at the University of Iowa trying to get his grades up. That was when he founded a social media brand called State Snaps. The focus of the company was to get images of party hard university culture. We're sure you can imagine the types of pics they'd get. They'd then grow online through the pictures going viral. But Rossi was extremely successful, and before long, his pages got hundreds of thousands of followers. He was pretty famous and was getting gigs left and right. But here's the issue Rossi's followers often use the slogan, do it for state, to get people to send their raunchy pictures to him. A successful influencer saw this as an opportunity and then decided to purchase the site, do it for state state.com but the site belonged to someone else and that person wasn't willing to sell it rossi threatened and begged and did everything he could to get the owner of the url to sell but the owner wasn't interested so rossi decided to do the sensible thing and hire his cousin sherman hopkins a homeless ex-con to force the owner of the site to transfer the site to him that must have been easier than just coming up with a different domain rossi drove his cousin to the person's house and waited while hopkins went in with a pantyhose covering his face and a a firearm in his hand. Unsurprisingly, the operation didn't work like Rossi thought it would. Injuries occurred and the police soon arrived at the scene and arrested the two. The dumb thing about this crime was that there was no way Rossi would have gotten away with it, even if Hopkins was successful. The victim would have just reported the incident to the police and Rossi and his cousin would have ended up in jail anyway. Number three, the lonesome granny. 54-year-old Grandma Geraldine Thomas claimed over 41,000 pounds in benefits over five years by claiming that she lived alone. But this grandma didn't live alone. Instead, she spent all that time secretly living with her partner in South Wales. So what did she do with all that money? We can't be sure of what she did with all of it, but we know she spent some of it on luxurious trips to Egypt. And we know that because instead of just keeping the pictures of her extravagant lifestyle to herself, she posted them online for everyone to see. And some of the people who eventually saw the picture were government officials. This led to an investigation that eventually revealed just how far Geraldine's scam went. The authorities found out that Geraldine had wrongly claimed income support, employment support, housing benefits, and council tax over five years. She was eventually arrested and taken to court to face the music. She was charged with three counts of benefits fraud, and she pled guilty to all of them. Lucky for her, she escaped serving any jail time and was handed a 12-month suspended sentence. But why post that stuff online? It looks like wisdom doesn't always follow age. Number two, powder noses. 
Courtney Larkin and Ellie Norton got into a world of trouble after the police walked in on them packing and bagging nose beers to distribute. When the police burst into their apartment, they were met with quite the scene. Let's paint a picture for you. Larkin and Morton sat near a mirror and had already packed one Aldi bag full of white, not-so-legal nose beers. It was clear that they were bagging the nose beers with the intent to distribute. If you know a lot about the law, you'd know that packing substances like that to distribute is a huge crime that you can't just be sent to rehab for. Both women, who were in their early 20s, had been preparing for a casual lunch date, but decided to dabble in their illegal wrapping and packing business before heading out. But the police had other plans. Once the police saw the scene in front of them, they arrested both Larkin and Morton and seized their phones. The women first refused to give their phone pins, but the authorities cracked the phones and discovered that Larkin, in particular, was something of a successful illegal substances entrepreneur. The police Police took inventory of the goods seized and found out that the street value of what the girls were selling was about 123,000 pounds. After their arrest, the authorities discovered that Larkin and Morton were both single mothers and Larkin had been separated from her kids by the care system. According to her lawyer, this led her to spiral into depression. After losing her kids, she turned to buying and selling nose beers and that's what got her into trouble. Morton, on the other hand, had just gone to visit Larkin and met her bagging her nose beers. Larkin then asked Morton to help her bag so that she would be done quickly, and apparently that was the wrong day for her to start a side hustle. The judge considered all the facts and sentenced Larkin to four years and 11 months in prison. Morton, on the other hand, was sentenced to two years in prison. However, her sentence was suspended for 20 months. Morton also had to complete 150 hours of unpaid work and 40 rehabilitation days. She was fitted with an electronic curfew tag that would stop her from leaving her home from 8 p.m. to 7 a.m. This story is sort of sad because because both Larkin and Morton are extremely pretty women with great figures. They could have been doing anything else. They were pretty enough to probably find some guy to take care of them or to get a large amount of fans. Pretty women tend to have a lot of options these days. And yeah, you might call us down for saying that based on morality, but let's remember what these women got in trouble for. Instead, they decided to be bagging and selling illegal substances and compromised any custody arrangements. Yeah, these ladies are pretty. Pretty dumb. Number one, flipping New Jersey. Caesar Humberto Pina, also known as Flipping NJ, has been arrested for running a Ponzi-like real estate scheme. Caesar often appeared on the popular hip-hop show Breakfast Club, hosted by Charlemagne, The God, and DJ Envy. While on the show, Caesar would promote his real estate business and tell listeners that he could provide a 45% return on investment in just four months. For those of you that follow the key to unlocking wealth, but that was hardly correct. According to the police, Caesar took a lot of the money that people invested in his business and used it for personal expenses. He also used part of the money to pay off other investors, Ponzi style. Caesar had been running the scheme for about six years and had defrauded a lot of people in that time. After he was arrested, the police also raided the breakfast club's offices and seized electronic devices. The interesting thing about this case is that DJ Envy was also named in a criminal complaint about Caesar. However, DJ Envy has come out to deny the rumors, and why wouldn't he? DJ Envy has said that he was a part of Caesar's company, but had no idea that there was a massive fraud going on. We find that a little hard to believe since Caesar usually took DJ Envy along on his fundraising campaigns where he told fantastic lies to would-be investors, but innocent until proven guilty, right? DJ Envy even alleged that he's also invested in Caesar's scheme and was yet to get his money back. But that's kind of shady, right? If DJ Envy really wasn't aware of the phony promises Caesar was making, but had invested without any of the promised returns, then why didn't he regularly team up with Caesar on his seminars? Didn't he know that his presence as a celebrity gave Caesar some legitimacy? While we don't know the whole truth, it seems unlikely that DJ Envy didn't know about the Ponzi side of Caesar's business. And if he didn't know, that constitutes a pretty huge oversight on his part. Caesar has pleaded not guilty to federal wire fraud charges and has been released on a million dollars bail as of the release of this video. The lesson here seems to be that if a celebrity is selling something that seems too good to be true, it probably is. Because they probably did zero due diligence on it or even worse, they're getting paid to promote it. Who are a few of the dumbest criminals who have trouble using their brain? Let's find out, starting with... Number seven, just advertising. 
Mark Wainfer thought he was the Tony Montagna of his town. He managed to pocket a whopping 230,000 pounds from his little dealing enterprise, but his need for attention was his undoing. You'd think a guy dealing with some criminal activities and finding some measure of success while doing it would know to keep a low profile, right? Like even in your house, because you never know who's gonna drop by. Like the police who actually did drop by. And they found over 14,000 pounds in cash just lying around his place, like spare change under the couch cushions. The police also stumbled upon some designer clothes, jewelry, and Rolex watches. They dug into Mark's phones, and inside, they found over 26,000 photos, 400 videos, 700 messages. Which is like a lot of people's phones, except it wasn't most people's phones. What was in those messages and photos? You guessed it. Mark showing off like he was starring in his very own gangster movie. He was posing next to stacks of cash big enough to build a castle, strutting his stuff at farms and grow specific plants, you name it. After all the smoke cleared, him, <clears throat> Mark found himself sentenced to 12 years behind bars. The court also ruled that Mark had to cough up 48,952 pounds. So here's the moral of the story. Crime might seem glamorous in the movies, but real life doesn't work that way. If you're gonna tread on the wrong side of the law, maybe don't document your crimes on your phone and flash your ill-gotten wealth. Real question here though, have you ever looked at someone posing with piles of cash and thought they were awesome? Why do people do this? Number six, spell check helps. William Hickson found himself in a pickle when his get-rich-quick scheme took an unexpected turn. Hickson, from Gateshead in the UK, had a stack of counterfeit 20-pound notes totaling a not-so-small fortune of 820 pounds. One day, Hickson got himself into a bit of trouble, unrelated to the funny money, so the police swooped in and conducted a routine search. They stumbled upon his secret stash, 41 of these fake notes tucked away in his sock. You'd think the police would be able to spot fake money a mile away, but instead of relying on their instincts and years of experience, they called in an expert from the Bank of England to confirm. So what ultimately gave away that the money was fake? It wasn't some sophisticated forgery finding technique or a brilliant detective on the case. No, it was that instead of printing 20 pounds on the notes, they opted for the local slang, labeling them as 20 pound. In the courtroom, Hickson owned up to having the counterfeit currency and admitted he would have used it given the chance. His lawyer tried to spin it like Hickson didn't know the money was fake at first, but said that eventually Hickson realized it was. The judge didn't re they threw in some rehab and a curfew for good measure. It's weird that the police had to bring in an expert to verify money with spelling errors on it though, right? If you've ever dealt with it, you know pretty quickly that something isn't right about the money, so even a brief examination would give it away. Sounds to us like some certain cops were being a bit lazy. Number five. Hey, is this you? Brianna Pretty, a waitress, had her wallet and ID stolen weeks before a bizarre incident unfolded that put her ID right back in her hands. Inside her stolen wallet were the usual suspects, money, credit cards, a checkbook, and her driver's license. One day, as Brianna was going about her duties, four customers walked in and took their seats. They began ordering drinks, nothing out of the ordinary, until the unthinkable happened. When Brianna asked one of the customers for identification, the young woman handed her an ID but the idea had something very familiar about it. Brianna found herself staring at her own picture on the driver's license, along with her name and address, because it was hers. But Brianna, keeping her cool, played along. She returned the ID, assuring the thief she'd be back with her margarita. Instead, she made a beeline for the phone and dialed the police. While she waited for the cops to arrive, Brianna kept serving drinks and appetizers, all while suppressing the urge to confront the thief. When the police finally showed up and took the woman into custody and discovered that the thief was apparently 85% moron, about 50% more than average, the woman didn't even need to use Brianna's ID because she was 26 years old at the time and of legal drinking age. Why wouldn't she just use her own ID? Maybe she was planning a dine and dash? But then again, which bartender really remembers names and addresses glancing at the birth date on a license? The woman was charged with theft, identity theft, and criminal impersonation for doing stupid things. As if that weren't enough, the police found narcotics in her possession, which promised further legal trouble. You would think she at least know basic things about the ID, like who is on it, what the birthday and expiration date are, things like that. But then, oh yeah, dumb people gonna dumb. Number four, easy savings. 
Karen Berger was accused of shoplifting nearly $1,000 worth of lighting from a Home Depot in Boca Raton, which is totally stupid because she didn't need to steal anything. Berger, who's probably got more money than the average American, lives in a $960,000 house. She decided she wanted to go shopping, so she went to Home Depot and loaded up her cart with fancy lighting fixtures worth almost a grand. Berger then headed to the self-checkout with her elaborate plan she spent a good five minutes coming up with. She scanned and paid for a few cheap moving boxes, but when it came to those pricey lighting fixtures, she conveniently forgot to scan them. She covered all of the angles. Berger ended up walking out with over $750 worth of unpaid merchandise, but she was caught on camera because, wouldn't you know it, the self-checkout has cameras everywhere to stop people from stealing. Home Depot's loss prevention squad was right on the case, and they caught her before she could make a getaway. Home Depot decided to press charges for retail grand theft, and Berger found herself in some serious trouble. She was arrested, and almost like it was for funsies, her bond was a cool grand, more than the value of the stuff she tried to swipe. If only she lived in a state with a higher minimum for shoplifting charges. It's always a little weird to hear about wealthy people shoplifting. It's like they're so bored with all the money they have that they have to do something to spice things up. So they try a little petty larceny. And how about that loss prevention squad? Was some dude just sitting there watching the self-checkout cameras for hours? There was probably a good chance that had the person been doing anything other than watching her, she would have gotten away with it. Do you work in loss prevention? Shout out in the comments if you have any insight. Number three, the good old 1099. Once a star of the hit reality show Dance Moms, Abby Lee Miller found herself in a dance of her own with the legal system, and it's a performance she'd rather forget. Miller is known for her tough love approach to teaching aspiring young dancers. She faced a judge in Pittsburgh who doled out some tough love of his own. Miller was sentenced to 366 days in federal prison over fraud charges. Abby Lee Miller was living the dream, or so it seemed. She was the star of the hit reality show Dance Moms, where she molded young aspiring dancers into stars. But behind the scenes, something wasn't quite right. She had raked in a nice $755,000 from her TV show and other projects, but she decided to play hide and seek with Uncle Sam. She didn't disclose all that dough to the US government, and that's where her dance with the law began. Did she think that TLC wasn't going to report that payout to the government? Abby Lee Miller ended up pleading guilty to bankruptcy fraud. She owned up to her financial missteps that led her to the courtroom in Pittsburgh, sobbing and begging for mercy. It was a far cry from the tough as nails dance instructor we all knew. In a heartfelt interview, Abby poured her heart out. She swore she never meant to hurt anyone, and if she knew the trouble filing for bankruptcy would cause, she'd steer clear. But despite her tearful plea, the judge wasn't swayed. Abby Lee Miller was sentenced to 366 days in federal prison. But Abby, always the drama queen, treated her time in the slammer like shooting a movie. She said she would pretend she was on location for 10 months, and she mentioned she had big plans like reading, learning Spanish, and even writing a book. After all, productivity in prison both start with P. After Miller's release, she'll be on supervised release for two more years and has to cough up $160,000 in fines. What makes this whole thing totally ridiculous is that Abby Lee Miller is no ordinary citizen. She's a celebrity, a low-level one, but still, she's known. Hiding her earnings from the show like TLC wasn't going to do everything above board was like trying to hide an elephant in a room of penguins. Number two, deep undercover. Maryland cop Francesco Marlette got himself suspended after getting into a questionable position with a woman in the back seat of his squad car. Francesco had a questionable past and he had already previously been suspended. Less than 10 years later, he'd forgotten any lessons he learned and he was back in the headlines for a whole new level of stupidity. Francesco was in broad daylight wearing his uniform and was seen locked in a passionate embrace with a scantily clad woman who was not his wife. But instead of keeping a low profile, our naughty officer Francesco decided to take her to the back of his squad car. We don't think he was interrogating her either. Or maybe he was. Who knows with how things are these days. We haven't been interrogated recently, but that modern interrogation technique seems uh, inappropriate. It wasn't like he was parked in some hidden alley either. He was doing all this out in the open, where anyone could see. Obviously, since everyone has seen it. Apparently, there were cameras all over the place, and a video taken by some dude ended up going viral. As Francesco and his lady friend disappeared 
into the back of the police car, people nearby were speaking in Spanish. One person even called him an animal. Kids were also playing nearby, and it's a scene straight out of a reality TV show. Now we're left with more questions than answers. Who is this woman? And what on earth possessed Francesco to do this while on the job? In a public place, with cameras everywhere. Literally, everyone is now walking around with a camera on them, so why would he think this wouldn't get noticed? Number one, running into the long arms of the law. Serial shoplifter Kirk Wharton managed to run straight into the arms of the police while attempting to evade capture during one of his crime sprees. Wharton's daring escapade came to a halt when he collided with police officers, ultimately leading to his arrest. Kirk decided it was the perfect time to hit up a cozy grocery store in Sherwood in the UK. But here's the thing. The police were already on to him because they were investigating a string of recent heists that Kirk had been doing. As Kirk gradually browsed the store shelves, an officer snuck in to check the CCTV footage. Just when Kirk thought he was in the clear, the shop staff dropped the bombshell. He'd been spotted. Our quick-thinking officer signaled her colleagues waiting outside in an unmarked police car. They were ready to pounce. The officer approached Kirk to make the arrest, but Kirk fueled by desperation and his insatiable appetite for stolen goods, decided it was now or never. He made a dash for the exit, hoping for a dramatic escape like in the movies. But instead of running away to freedom, he ran straight into more officers who were standing at the front door. And we mean literally. With Kirk's criminal journey abruptly halted by the epic collision with the law, he was left with no choice. In court, he pleaded guilty to all 26 counts against him for the 2,200 50 pounds worth of stolen goods. The judge, clearly unimpressed by Kirk's capers, gave him 22 weeks behind bars. Who are the dumbest criminals alive? Let's find out, starting with... Number 6. Bad Company A pair of brainless dancers stole a Boston police officer's weapon while spending time with him in his hotel room. The cop, whose name was left out of the report for some reason, arranged to meet a girl named Niche Natalia Rivera, who he met on Instagram at a Rhode Island bar. The pair ended up meeting at the Narrow Lounge in Providence, Rhode Island, where they met up with Melissa Dacier. After Narrow Lounge, the trio headed to the Cadillac Lounge Club. Sounds fancy, right? The Cadillac Lounge! How exciting! Way better than the Pontiac Lounge down the street. Anyway, while they were on their way to the Cadillac Lounge, for some dumb reason, the officer mentioned that he locked his service weapon with a cable lock inside the glove compartment of his BMW. You know, in case the trustworthy ladies he met online and at the club were curious where his weapon was. Rivera and Dessier accompanied the cop back to his hotel for some alone time. Towards the end of their time together, Dessier asked to borrow the officer's phone charger. So he handed her his keys and she went to his car. Shortly after she returned, she said she needed to make a phone call and stepped out of the room. After Dessier was gone for a while, Rivera, or Natalia as the officer knew her, went to look for her friend. Some time passed before the officer realized the women weren't coming back. He checked on his car and saw that the glove box was open and the cable lock box was in one of the seats. That's when he realized his service weapon was missing and he called the police. He explained about Natalia, who Pawtucket police identified as Niche Rivera, a dancer at the Foxy Lady Club, who was charged with providing adult services a few months before this incident. Dacier also had passed charges as well. Since Niche was dumb enough to give the officer her Instagram, it was easy for authorities to track down the two women and arrest them. They were held without bail as violators of their previous charges and were charged with felony larceny of a firearm and conspiracy. What do you think about cops that hang out with exotic dancers. Is it a fair way for them to blow off steam or does it place them a little too close to a position where they can make mistakes? Number five, DoorDash Disguise. 
DoorDash driver Juliana Sagaram decided to use her food delivery gig as a cover for a porch piracy scheme. She was caught on camera pretending to deliver food to homes while actually swiping packages from people's doorsteps. Seems that her dumb plan didn't take into account the fact that, like, everyone has a ring camera on their front doors. Sagaram, who's from Queens, embarked on a two-day spree of using her DoorDash status to dupe residents into believing she was delivering their meals, but karma finally finally caught up with her. One person realized his package was missing and reported it, and surprisingly, it triggered an investigation, since it normally seems like law enforcement doesn't do much about package thieves. The scheme unraveled when doorbell camera footage showed Sagaram in action. Dressed in a bright orange skirt and a black crop top with sunglasses, she approached the doors of houses, appearing to leave a door dash bag on the doorstep. But instead of walking away after delivering the food, she swiped the package, taking both the stolen goods and bag of food, and and ran away. Sagaram's actions show how porch pirates have gotten more creative in their attempts to snatch packages, often exploiting their day jobs to do it. With so many doorbell security cameras capturing every move, her dumb scam would hardly go unnoticed. Sagaram's eventual arrest led to her being charged with two counts of petit larceny and given an appearance ticket. As more homeowners employ security measures to protect their parcels, porch pirates like Sagaram must find better tactics or consider another career choice. To truly succeed in their shady endeavors, porch pirates must either find residences without cameras or become magicians who can disappear into thin air. Or maybe just stop stealing from people. Number four, Tree of Andre Therapy. Thomas Elric used his position in the National Health Service, a publicly funded healthcare system in the UK, to pay himself over half a million pounds through a fake company he created with his wife's email. Elric could only make these payments because he worked as the assistant managing director for planned and unscheduled care at Harrow Clinical Commissioning Group. His position meant he could approve payments of up to 50,000 pounds with minimal oversight. But in Instead of keeping his head down and doing honest work, Elric thought that it was best to use his position to enrich himself. And in order to do that, he came up with a fairly stupid ruse. He created a company called Tree of Andre Therapy Services Limited and paid the company around £564,000 through fraudulent invoices. He made the payments 28 times, so this was pretty much a routine for him. Elric registered the company in Scotland, and the money paid to the firm went straight into a bank account registered under his name. Elric also had a brilliant plan to cover up his tracks. He took over his wife's email account and used it to send an email to the NHS claiming to be from the Tree of Andre Therapy Services. The email contained anonymized details of fictional patients and made his operation look legitimate. It does sound like a good plan, but there was just one tiny problem with it. His wife had passed away eight years earlier. Why he would choose to use his wife's email instead of just creating a new email is anyone's guess. If anyone even peeked at that transaction, they would quickly discover it was fraudulent because she's already passed and she was his wife. It wouldn't take a genius to put two and two together. Elric had plenty of fun while the going was good. He traveled around the world, stayed in five-star hotels, and spent small fortunes dining in top restaurants. He also spent healthy sums on Amazon, Apple, and health club David Lloyd. Unfortunately, Elric couldn't live the good life forever. One day, a colleague looked at his invoices and found the name of Elric's fictional company a bit suspicious. So he dug around and found out that Tree of Andre Therapy Services wasn't registered on the Care Quality Commission website. The colleague then found out that the company was linked to Elric. This set off a full-blown investigation that led a police raid on Elric's home. Further investigation revealed that Elric always made sure the invoices from the Tree of Andre were always allocated to him, and he was the one making the approval. In the end, Elric had his day in court and was charged with fraud. He admitted that he'd set up the company to defraud the NHS and said he was sorry. The judge said he misused his position and hurt many patients who could have benefited from the money he stole. He was eventually sentenced to three years and eight months in jail. One way to prevent crimes like this is to make sure that someone else cross-checks approved invoices. Giving one person the power to check and approve invoices leads to situations like this, and creating a checks and balance system will most likely eradicate such scams. And if you're going to set up a fake company to commit fraud, probably don't use your deceased wife's email. Number three, Cleveland? 
Two fast food restaurant workers in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, had quite a strange encounter during an armed robbery. The suspect, Cleveland Willis, who entered a KFC restaurant wearing a black ski mask, faced a memorable identification from his victims. The robbery occurred when Willis walked into the restaurant dressed in all black and was carrying a pistol. He pointed it at one of the employees, pulled back the slide, and demanded money. In response, both employees quickly opened two cash registers, surrendering a total of just over $600 to the would-be robber. The victims, despite Willis's attempt at concealing his identity, quickly recognized him as a former co-worker. They recognized his voice and distinctive facial features that remain visible through the holes in his mask. While one of the victims stood with their hands up, they said, Cleveland, is that you? Willis responded that, no, it wasn't him. But it was. It seems that Willis underestimated how well his co-workers knew him. Next, in his attempt to escape the scene of the crime, he took off in a silver Nissan Altima, the same car he used while working at the restaurant. This only added to the evidence stacked against him. Following the incident, Cleveland Willis was arrested by the East Baton Rouge Parish Sheriff's Office, charging him with armed robbery. Obviously, Cleveland wasn't a criminal mastermind, but how dumb would you need to be to think you'd get away with robbing your most recent job? He even drove his own car. It makes you wonder if when they asked if it was him and he said no, if he thought that was good enough to fool everyone. He was like, man, how'd they know it was me? I said it wasn't me, and I didn't even park in the same spot I normally do. Number two, the parking scam. In Houston, Texas, a man allegedly left a restaurant, discharged a firearm at a fake parking attendant who had just swindled him out of $40 and then returned to continue his date. Eric Aguirre, the alleged assailant, was already on probation. While dining with an unnamed woman, they parked separately in a lot in Houston's Edu neighborhood. There, they met Elliot Nix a man who was posing as a parking attendant, convincing the couple to hand over $40 for parking. However, Aguirre and his date soon realized they had been scammed. A waiter at the restaurant recognized the fake parking attendant and warned the couple about the scam. Aguirre became furious since he had just been had and was already carrying a firearm because he's in Texas, so of course he was. So he left his date inside and chased Nix down the street. The confrontation led to Nix passing on the side of the road. Aguirre acted nonchalantly after the incident, returning to his car to stow away his weapon before heading back to the restaurant. There, he reassured his date that everything was fine and he had only scared Nix. It was only a matter of time before law enforcement responded to the incident. Police officers were called, discovered Nick's body, and began their investigation. Aguirre's date remained in the dark about the events until police released photos of the two individuals together, identifying them as persons of interest. Realizing the seriousness of the situation, the woman contacted the police, provided a statement, and cooperated with the authorities. After a warrant was issued for his arrest, Aguirre was captured in his hometown of Corpus Christi and brought back to Harris County. He faced charges in connection with Nick's passing. It's stupid that this guy, who was already in trouble with the law, basically assured himself that he was going to jail for a long time, over $40. And he just went back to eat because apparently he's a total psychopath. Can you imagine what his date was like finding out what happened days later? How was the date? Oh, it was good. Other than this weird part in the middle of dinner. Looks like she may have literally dodged a bullet. Number one, the big bluff. Melissa Love, a mom from the UK, had a bad experience trying to purchase Taylor Swift tickets for her teenage daughter. She hatched a plan to turn the tables on the scammer and recover her money. Melissa's ordeal began when she came across a great ticket offer on a community group on Facebook. An individual by the name of Dave Shepard appeared to be a legitimate seller, had mutual friends, and a convincing profile. Melissa thought she found the sought-after Taylor Swift tickets and transferred 680 pounds to this guy. However, her excitement soon turned into disappointment when the tickets never arrived. It became apparent that Dave Shepard, who initially passed the vibe check, was in fact a Russian scammer who had successfully conned her. Frustrated but not defeated, Melissa decided to take matters into her own hands. She fabricated documents suggesting she had contacted her bank's fraud team and heavily implied that they could trace the scammer's IP address. To make the deception even better, she falsely referred to the International Banking Act of 1970 
1979, then created a fake alliance of fellow villagers who were supposedly working to expose the scammer. One friend, in on the ruse, claimed to have connections in Wise, a payment services company, and said that they had prosecuted numerous scammers. In reality, it was all a fabrication, but it played on the scammer's fear. After a weekend of skillful manipulation and what she humorously dubbed as scamming the scammer, Melissa was thrilled to find the money returned to her bank account on Monday morning. This story showcases how one person's determination and resourcefulness can make all the difference when faced with online scams. While Melissa's strategy may have seemed like a long shot, she had nothing to lose, and it ultimately paid off recovering her money. This goes to show that not all scammers are invincible, and even those new to the game can be outsmarted by someone willing to stand up and fight back. That scammer must have been new to the game to fall for this one. Melissa's experience serves as a warning to potential victims, demonstrating the importance of being careful when buying something from an unfamiliar seller. As always, remember that if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Who are some of the dumbest criminals out there? Let's find out, starting with... Number six, let's bring them back. A wealthy Florida man fell victim to a daring robbery orchestrated by two women he had brought back to his Broward County townhouse. The unidentified man's choice to invite the two women he met at the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino back to his house probably wasn't his best decision. The women ended up stealing his shoes, his gun, and his diamond-encrusted Rolex. Two of these things he probably should have kept a much better eye on. The prize of the heist was no doubt the Rolex, which was worth worth about $25,000. This intricately designed timepiece held not only a significant monetary value, but was also a great way for the guy to show off that he has a lot of money. It makes you wonder if the watch is what attracted the attention of the women who chose to rob him. There's a bunch of clear footage from the casino on the man meeting these two elegant ladies at the bar around 3 a.m. He'd exchanged numbers with one of them and then ended up meeting with them again about an hour later. So now it's 4 a.m. and he decides to take these two complete strangers back to his place to attempt to have a nice time. He probably was going to play board games or something. So they get back to his place and he falls asleep. The women were probably all disappointed they couldn't show off their monopoly skills, so they decided to steal his stuff instead. When the guy woke up the next morning, his watch, shoes, firearm, and his platinum Amex had been taken. And sadly, the two refined ladies were nowhere to be seen. So the guy texted whichever one of them he called before, asking for them to just return his stuff. He was ignored because, of course he was. He picked up two chicks in a casino bar at 3 a.m., and nothing good ever happens after 3 a.m. But, for some reason, he waits until 5 p.m. that night to file a police report. He probably didn't want to call the cops because he was hoping true love would prevail. It did not. So, now police have loads of footage of these two queens, along with one of their cell numbers, and they have his credit card that if they use, he will know where they are. No doubt those women shouldn't have done what they did, and they were stupid for stealing from this guy since they were on camera and he has their cell number. But really, when you meet two women in a bar at 3 a.m. and you bring them back to your place and then go to sleep, you're kind of asking to be ripped off. Who's at fault here? Let us know in the comments below. Number five, just my account, please. McRoberts Williams, whose first sounds like his last name and probably confused all of his teachers, found himself in police custody following a bank robbery. Williams targeted a Wells Fargo bank in Wilmington, Delaware, where he approached a young teller, handed her a note demanding $150, and explained it was a robbery. As the new hundredaire fled the bank on foot, he began to wonder where he should stash his stack of bills. He didn't want anyone to steal it, so he stopped at a nearby ATM and deposited the stolen money right into his own bank account. Williams's behavior may seem like there's some underlying issues, but he later disclosed to the police that his mind was actually being controlled by an external force through an implant in his body. Such statements obviously point towards some mental health struggles that might have contributed to his actions. During the robbery, Williams apologized to the bank teller after handing her the robbery note. As he walked out a little bit richer, she triggered the silent alarm. The police quickly arrived, and the chase ended with Williams hiding behind a nearby shopping center where local troopers eventually located and apprehended him. Despite not immediately recovering the stolen money, police did find a Wells Fargo bank card in Williams' possession. McRoberts Williams was charged with second-degree robbery, and his arrest came with a $6,000 cash bond. The teller must have been so confused when Williams was demanding such a small amount. She was probably like, 
are you sure you don't want more? That's it? Usually robbers ask for all of the money. Then she goes into autopilot. Uh, how did you want that? Large bills? Uh, thank you for choosing Wells Fargo. Number four, Fire Festival of Pizza. Ishmael Osaker, the mastermind behind what has been dubbed the Fire Festival of Pizza, referencing the infamous Fire Festival scandal, Osaker essentially planned a whole pizza party and ended up ripping a bunch of people off in the process. Promising an extravagant celebration of pizza, a truly noble food worthy of its own festival, the idea held an enticing appeal for pizza enthusiasts, which is basically everyone. The festival promised a delectable array of dough, cheese, and toppings, but the actual experience ended up being far from what was promised. Attendees who had eagerly purchased tickets with prices soaring as high as $75 were disappointed when they were handed tiny little slivers of pizza. You know, the ones we're talking about too, because there's always that one last piece in the box that no one wants and it gets all stale really fast. It's usually given to the youngest child who won't care or the least popular person in the room. Not only were the pizza slices way too small, but apparently they tasted awful as well. The mismatch between what was advertised and what was delivered made a whole lot of pizza partiers very unhappy. The festival itself was also plagued by an air of inadequacy. Empty tents and a lack of vendors contributed to a sense of hollowness that permeated the gathering. Adding further fuel to the fire, Osaker's team resorted to posting excuses on Facebook, blaming pizza delivery delays for the pathetic offerings, and even suggested a makeup sampling to placate the disgruntled attendees. The New York City Pizza Festival wasn't Osaker's first venture into organizing scam festivals either. A similar pattern had unfolded with his African Food Festival the previous year, where attendees were shortchanged as the event grossly underdelivered what was promised. And to make the pizza festival an even bigger disaster, Osaker had also scheduled a simultaneous hamburger festival dubbed Burgerfest, honoring the second most noble food in the exact same place. It's like Osaker was like, well, this first food festival crashed and burned, so how can I do worse the second time? Oh, I know, I'll put on two of them. As the day went on and more and more people were furious, Hangry Garden, the event curation company, became a focal point of blame. Hangry Garden was accused of causing delays and being responsible for the festival's shortcomings. However, Hangry Garden's co-founder, Jeremy S. Gary, wasn't about to take the fall. He was quick to clarify that their withdrawal from the event was because of Osaker's failure to uphold his end of the deal and his misleading them about the event's logistics. The event was such an outrageous catastrophe that the New York York Attorney General's office launched an investigation into Osaker's activities. Once he learned he was being investigated, Osaker begrudgingly offered refunds to the attendees. But despite the mounting evidence of his wrongdoing, Osaker still complained about negative press coverage and attempted to shift blame onto others like he's a victim. He said that certain newspapers reported without facts, quotes, or context. Osaker was eventually issued a court order banning him from organizing events in New York and was required to pay $311 thousand three hundred and ninety eight dollars in restitution and penalties with one hundred and eleven thousand one hundred ninety eight bucks designated for duped customers and one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the state the only way that pizza festival could have been worse is if all they had was pineapple pizza pineapples have no business on pizza shout out if you agree number three principled embezzler Nia Wilson, a former principal of New Mission High School in Boston, misappropriated school funds for her personal gain. She faced charges for wire fraud, revealing an elaborate scheme that saw her misusing nearly $40,000 to fund her own extravagant, all-inclusive vacations, including two trips to Barbados. Wilson's fraudulent activities spanned from 2006 to 2019, allowing her to rip off the school for nearly 13 years. During this time, she requested checks from the school's external fiscal agent account under the names of other people. These checks were then endorsed by Wilson herself after being deposited into her personal bank account. This practice allowed her to siphon off school funds without arousing suspicion. The former principal used her ill-gotten gains to finance two vacations to Barbados. But what makes her scheme a little worse is that she even had funds dispersed for her friends who came with her on these trips. Wilson's actions aren't only ethically questionable, but also unwise, 
given the paper trail that was left behind. She may have been able to avoid detection, but the minute someone noticed, it was game over. Her financial maneuverings and the apparent mismanagement of school funds eventually raised the red flags that ultimately led to her arrest and subsequent charges. Wilson pled guilty to her crimes and has agreed to pay restitution. At the time of this video, she also faces a maximum prison sentence of 20 years for wire fraud, along with up to three years of supervised release and a fine of up to $250,000. And Saturday school. Number two, scamming the IRS while being supervised by the IRS. Matthew Meredith, a resident of St. Petersburg, got himself sentenced to six years in prison for orchestrating a scheme that saw him amass a substantial fortune through false tax claims, which he then used to live an extravagant lifestyle. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Tampa said that in the span of six months, Meredith submitted five fake tax claims, seeking refunds totaling more than $170 million. Meredith's ruse first bore fruit when the IRS issued him a refund check worth $6,374,576.92 based on his fictitious claim. Claims. Meredith's newfound wealth let him buy not just one, but six Mercedes Benzes totaling $843,269. And he didn't stop there, because why be low key when you're stealing from the government? Meredith next purchased a sprawling mansion with 6,500 square feet of waterfront opulence located in St. Petersburg. He paid cash for this upscale residence, which amounted to $2.6 million. What makes Meredith's scheme even more audacious is that he did this while while under federal supervision following a conviction on contraband-related charges. His criminal history didn't stop him from scamming, which started up nearly four years from the time of his release. With a mountain of evidence and a growing trail of extravagant purchases, Meredith pleaded guilty to theft of government property and money laundering, earning him six years behind bars. Why Meredith, with no legitimate proof of income, would choose to invest in real estate with cash makes almost no sense, as if it's not going to attract attention. The IRS was going to eventually catch the error, so he probably should have just hid the money, said he lost it all gambling and done some time. Not that we've uh, thought about such things. We're just saying. Number one, a hole in one. Brenton Fillers, also known as the TikTok trickster, got himself arrested for theft and fraud charges across multiple states. Fillers allegedly swindled women out of money and possessions through a calculated scheme that relied on his charm and deceit. Fillers' MO involved connecting with women on TikTok, building relationships with them by showering attention and affection, and then making requests for money and other favors. Once he gained their trust, he would abruptly vanish, leaving his victims in emotional, financial distress. Stress. Fillers had been operating this con for quite some time, with a criminal history spanning over three decades. One of his victims, a woman known only as Trisha, shared her experience. She first encountered Fillers on TikTok, where he went by the alias Jason Mitchell. After connecting, he managed to manipulate her emotions and eventually convinced her to pick him up from the airport in Mobile, Alabama. He was already with another woman driving to Texas after she had loaned him $1,000 to help deal with some supposed issues with the IRS. Somehow, he ended up leaving the woman, stealing all of her cash and credit cards in the process, and getting in contact with Trisha, asking her to pick him up at the airport. After spending a few days with Trisha, he said he was going to take her car to the shop for her, and never came back. Fillers' vanity became his downfall. He was posting pictures of himself proudly displaying trophies from golf tournaments in Texas that attracted attention from law enforcement. Chief John Barber of the Spanish Fort Police Department explained that it was these photographs that allowed them to arrest him. Authorities were able to track him down at the University of Kentucky Hospital where he was seeking treatment, calling one of his victims and telling her the name of his doctor. Police confirmed his identity from the golf pictures, his location from the victim, and kaboom, he was arrested. Fillers now faces charges in multiple states, including theft of property in Alabama, felony fraud use of a credit card in Arkansas, and theft of a motor vehicle in Tennessee, his victims and the public are reminded dangers lurking in the world of social media. Brandon, if you're running scams, you probably shouldn't be proudly posting pictures of yourself all over the place winning golf tournaments, or just being a generally terrible person. Who are some of the dumbest criminals around? Let's find out, starting with... Number six, flexing for the police. Emily Locke is a dealer's girlfriend. She accidentally exposed a major distribution ring by bragging about her lavish lifestyle on social media. 
Yep, this is one of those downsides of posting for validation. Despite working as a part-time grocery store employee, where she earned less than $12,000 a year, Locke's social media portrayed a life of luxury. She wore designer clothes and shoes and went on extravagant vacations. Along with her dealer boyfriend, Mark Price, she spent $120,000 on jet setting and expensive goods. Price claimed he was a struggling builder, but drove an Audi RS4, which sells for around $138,000. Although she lived in a small town in Wales, Locke was obsessed with the idea of living like a celebrity and donned Vivian Westwood purses, Gucci sunglasses, Christian Louboutin shoes, and Christian Dior perfume. The couple traveled around the world to places like Miami, Las Vegas, Dubai, France, Amsterdam, and Spain, and Locke documented each of their trips on social media. She shared selfies of her tanning on the beach and pictures of iconic locations like the Bellagio Fountains in Las Vegas. Things were going good, but she had to brag, and eventually, Locke's social media accounts led law enforcement to the couple. Although she was clearly spending a lot more money than she was making at the grocery store, she told the police that she had no idea Price dealt illegal substances and genuinely believed he was a builder. Police raided Price's home and found a blue plastic bag containing, you guessed it, nose beers. They also seized his cell phone where they found texts of him bragging about his weekly earnings. Authorities also discovered the receipt for his Audi. He admitted to possessing a bunch of nose beers with the intent to sell. During his trial, the court also learned that he took out a $39,000 loan where he fraudulently stated he had been employed by a construction company that went out of business. Law enforcement searched Locke's residence and found a bunch of things she shouldn't be able to afford, such as designer clothing, jewelry, watches, bags, and other accessories. They estimated that she had $60,000 worth of belongings in her home. Price's lawyer attempted to convince the judge that his client was just a little immature and made a mistake. You know, those immature dealers. The judge was unconvinced and gave him seven years in jail. Locke's defense argued that she had been a good student with good grades and was working towards a degree in law and criminology. Her plan was to become a probation officer, but she took a job at the grocery store to earn money and became obsessed with living a celebrity lifestyle like many people her age. She was sentenced to 15 months in prison. Locke's phone records helped the police locate other members of the ring, with one accomplice, Christopher Morgan, receiving 20 months in jail, and the other, Kyle Crowley, being sentenced to five years in prison. Maybe if Locke had refrained from bragging about her Kim Kardashian lifestyle while earning a cashier's salary, she would have never been caught. But if it's not posted online, it didn't happen, right? Number five, the silly piggies. Haley Oates attempted to distract police officers so she could drive away from a bar after a night of drinking. She wanted to do some drunk driving just so she could save a little bit of money endangering people's lives. Logical! Oates was partying with a male friend at the Grasshopper 2 bar in New Jersey, and she was over the legal limit when the time came to leave. There was heavy police activity around the bar, and Oates knew she would get caught if she got behind the wheel. But rather than finding a safer way to get home, she decided to distract police officers so she could sneak away without them noticing. Oates's clever plan was to call 911 and claim a woman was being attacked at Mother's Ale House, a neighboring bar. She told the operator that the made-up suspect was driving a blue pickup and hung up. Law enforcement arrived on the scene to find no disturbance. They reviewed the bar's surveillance tape and discovered that there was never an altercation. Despite the phony 911 call, Oates would have probably gotten away with her driving under the influence if she hadn't bragged on Facebook about her scheme to avoid a DUI. Yes, this is how dumb people are. Really. These people absolutely exist. In the post, she referred to the cops as silly piggies. The comment helped authorities piece together what happened that night, and they arrested Oates for filing false reports to law enforcement and creating false alarms. It's so strange to think that people actively insist on driving while intoxicated. The number of lives lost each year to this habit is horrible. Nearly everyone's life has been touched by it in some way, yet here we are with our hero hero, Haley Oates, bragging about driving drunk. Number four, thirsty for likes. 
Speaking of ratting on yourself on social media, an unnamed online shopper bragged about scamming his way into a refund for an order he bought at Asus, a British online fashion retailer. The Orlando-based shopper ordered a package from the British retailer, but claimed it never arrived. He complained to the store about not receiving his items and got his money back. However, his order had arrived and he had lied to get a refund. The shopper might have gotten away with his scam if he didn't brag about it on Twitter. Twitter. Asus replied to his tweet and thanked him for posting about his lie because they may have never found out if he hadn't put it online. Users called him out for stealing and embarrassing himself. Although he later deleted the tweet, it had 244 retweets and 3,200 likes. Number 3. Skimming himself a dumb con man known only as Hamid P used a 3D printer to create false fronts for ATMs and clone credit and debit cards. But he was caught when he tested them out with his own card. The con man intended to use the fake fronts to clone hundreds of people's cards in the southern French towns of Nimes and saint Ambroy. He planned for unsuspecting members of the public to unknowingly put their cards through a skimmer that he hid inside the ATMs. Skimmers secretly steal card details details while dispensing cash as usual, giving users no reason to believe the device stole their information. Hamid wanted to make sure that his device was working properly and tested it with his own card. Using his credit card on a public ATM made it easy for police to track him down. Why would he not think authorities would go over all the IDs that they think were compromised? At the time, Hamid was on the run with $29,000 that he already stole. Authorities found him in Marseille, France and arrested him. Law enforcement found the 3D printer at his home and he confessed to the scam. It's not a bad idea to test the device, but why use his own card? Was he gonna go make a social media post online and let all his friends know that his skimming device worked too? Number two, ghost nurses. Dr. Thuane Nunez Ferreira used fake silicon fingers to trick the hospital scanner into recording the attendance of her coworkers when they weren't at work. The ghost worker's scam occurred in Ferraz de Vasconcelos, a town near Sao Paulo in Brazil. Medics at the office of Mobile Energy Care need to sign in using their hands to record their attendance on a biometric machine. Dr. Ferreira claimed that she wasn't the only person involved in the scheme. She told authorities that signing in absent employees was a condition of her employment and that the hospital coordinator, Jorge Curie, was the head of the operation. 11 doctors and 20 nurses were also believed to be involved in the scam, many of whom were suspended. Despite the suspension, a Brazilian website reported that five of the doctors still received their wages during the inquiry. Brazil's health ministry opened an audit into the hospital in order to understand who was involved in the scam and how it operated. The health security called hospital coordinator Jorge Curie and forced him to speak to police. He said that the claims against him were absurd and that he had a good reputation after being a city official for 25 years. Curie also said that he had no idea what was happening at the hospital. Always good to hear from the guy who's supposed to be running the show. Asir Philo, the town's mayor, alleged that roughly 300 civil servants falsely claimed their salaries without going to work. In a press conference, he referred to the absent workers as ghosts. Philo called for putting cameras to monitor the clocks to avoid more ghost worker scams. Dr. Ferreira had been under surveillance when she was caught using the silicon fingers to fool the biometric machine into recording her co-worker's attendance. She was arrested and confessed to falsifying a public document. Dr. Ferreira, being a doctor, could make enough money to support herself without the scam. So we're not sure why she'd go along with this. Supposedly, it was a condition of her employment, which also sounds weird because why would the hospital want to pay for people who aren't even there. However, using the fake fingers was clever and thus asked the question, was the scam super smart or super dumb? Tell us in the comments. Number one, give me all your money and your phone number. Armed robber Damien Boyce forced his victim, Amber Baran, to add him on Facebook where he asked her out on a date. After robbing her, Baran returned home after a long day at work at 4 a.m. and was grabbing mail from her mailbox when Boyce approached her. He pulled out a weapon from his pocket and demanded she let him into her house. Baran smartly refused to let him inside and instead gave him all of the cash she had on her, which came to roughly $100. Boyce then asked if she had a boyfriend and insisted she connect with him on social media while keeping his weapon pointed at her. Sheikh and Baran hoped that adding him would make him leave, and it did. But shortly after he left her home, he started messaging her on Facebook. Boyce said that it was a messed up way to meet someone and promised to pay her the money back, adding that she was too pretty to steal from. Baran sent him an understanding response, acknowledging that he must be going through a tough time to resort to armed robbery. But he wouldn't stop 
stopped messaging her and asked her to come over to his place. Baran said that, although Boy stole just $100 from her, it bothered her more that he also took her sense of security, something that would take a long time to get back. When law enforcement came to arrest him, he hid inside a building until a SWAT team arrived, forcing him to surrender to authorities. Boyce was charged in the gunpoint robbery of Baran and held on a $7,500 bond. Maybe if he hadn't been so determined to stay in touch with her after the incident, he would have avoided his latest arrest. How someone is this misguided, we don't know. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comments section what you'd rather do. Go to jail for two weeks or only be able to listen to Cardi B's music for two years.